The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, good morning, folks. This is real, 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 real basic. Uh, if you normally know my SQLs, you might be bored to hear this. Peter Zeitschup has a wonderful talk on indexing that I highly recommend. So, if you know what an index is with my SQL, and you can solve it a couple times, please uh, go to that talk. This is my SQL one-on-one. Once again, MySQL, not MySQL. The old timers will cringe when you say MySQL, uh, which is a nice party trick if you're around a bunch of the old timers. But what's going to occur MySQL? Well, what is MySQL? Well, it's a relational database management system. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the data records within the various tables have some sort of connection between them, usually some sort of key or some sort of number to use. The SQL part stands for Structured Query Language, which was developed 20, 30 years ago as a way to get information out of databases. Uh, if you want to end this with time, we talk about no SQL and why SQL is so universally hated by so many folks. Okay, quick agenda for a 40 minute talk. So hopefully we'll get through all of this. Okay, MySQL runs on just about anything. Um, it's, it's, it runs on Mac, or it runs on Windows, or it runs on Linux, or it runs on Solaris. Um, it runs on just about anything. It's fairly easy to uh, get a copy. You can get binaries, you can get RPMs, you can get devs, uh, you can get Windows installers. Uh, by the way, the Windows installer on modern Windows boxes, you can install MySQL in under three minutes. That includes test databases, all the connectors, and work. And if that doesn't work for you, when you're the creative type that wants to do, you need to get the source code to MySQL. And that's the community edition. And what I recommend is your distros are usually several months to several years to find what MySQL is offering. So I usually tell people go out to dev.mysql.com and download the latest and greatest for your box. So if you're using data package manager, Use AppGap or RPM. Uh, sometimes they have slightly different names depending on what the package manager is calling it this year. But it's going to be something like MySQL 5 or 5.5 5 or 5.6, whatever they're calling it. By the way, our latest is MySQL 5.6. It's been out for about two months now. I'll drop by the MySQL table right there and tell you some of the benefits of it. Okay, if you're going with the binaries, do we have binary fans here or are you all happy? She's got a countdown face. Are you, you're not a binary fan? Okay. Well, if you want to go with the binary, you download the chart file. Uh, and then you work through these various steps. Real simply, it is you have a root for MySQL and a user for MySQL. Well, why is that? Um, old timers will tell you that you never want to run any sort of service as root. Mainly because once a bad person takes over that service, they're not on that box. Next thing you do is you go to user local where your favorite directory is. Unchart the file. Uh, link it so whenever the MySQL 5.6.12.hard da 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 then it means actually just MySQL. And then CD MySQL. Change the ownership of the group of the uh, directory. Then you run a script called MySQL install. Uh, MySQL install for DB. With either MySQL, once again, you don't want to run it as a group. Uh, or change on again. Uh, next to the end, we're optional, we'll talk about that a little later. And then you start up by running a wrapper script called MySQL V underscore take. Once again, it's MySQL. And that is the worst case install for MySQL. Um, some of you who are used to packages say, well, you just do app get install and you're done. Yeah. But if you're forced to visit island without apps, this is what you're going to end up doing. MySQL config, config, uh, configuration files. The uh, 
Configuration problems we had up until 5.6 have not aged well. A huge system that's listed as six means of memory. I know a couple of you probably have phones with 10 times that memory in your pockets right now. Uh, one of the first things to do is grab one of these configuration files. I prefer, prefer the medium one. And go through there and set the NODB buffer size to roughly 78 percent of your system's memory. Uh, I've talked a lot of talk today in this room uh, where I go into more depth and we'll give you more detail on that. By the way, if you use the built-in default files, they're guaranteed to be kind of tiny for your system, so it will choke off your database. So come back to the performance uh, talk later today, we'll talk about the two those. Okay, so we're running a wrapper. What does that actually do? Um, I started playing with BSD on Max. I was always starting the script trying to figure out what they were doing. Uh, well, it's basically doing the same thing as the init script or the service or whatever. It's running a, a program called MySQL D for data. Once again, always run that as your MySQL user, never run a front end description. Now, the best thing you can do is put in all your options into a configuration file. Uh, most modern Linuxes, Etsy, MySQL, uh, my.tni. And in there, you can put in all the directives that you want your system to run. Um, Luddites can type every command option on the command screen which is painful, error prone, and just kind of something to do with your cantankerous. <laughs> but, if you're like everyone else, you'll end up with a configuration file. Now, the configuration file is divided into different sections. You see one up here that says client, one that says MySQL, and one for data. Uh, once again, you can type in all these by hand, but don't. Please do a configuration file. Someday you want to go on vacation, you want to be able to start by the hand and find that for your favorite activity. Now, how do you do that file? Well, the section is whatever the name is in phrases. Client, that's the client program we're getting to. In this case, we're going to talk on port 3306, which is the default port for MySQL. For anything that's a general MySQL, we're telling the default character that is Latin 1. That will work for client and that will also work for the name down here. Um, if you can get away with running Latin 1 in your shop, do it. Uh, if you need to run the extended character set, use UTF 8 or something similar, do not mix and match them. What happens when you mix and match character sets? You see one big smile back there. You get do that you cannot do anything with. You get data files, well, you get database tables that are absolutely useless. So let's take a look at this file. Client is on port 3306. The uh, default character is Latin 1. And for the server, we're saying on 3306. And we're saying, okay, we can install all this stuff here on Windows box. I'm seeing program files, MySQL, MySQL server 5.5. Oh, by the way, these slides are available online from slideshare.net slash hstokes. And if you go down to the bottom of each of these slides, where applicable, I have where you can actually look up the information. Okay, you got it started. What's the first thing you want to do after you get it started? You want to stop my SQL. Um, you can turn off the box. You can pull the power cord if not recommended. Uh, if you're running the service, you can type service my SQL stop. You can use the NFD script. Or you can run MySQL admin, minus user root, shut down. Uh, databases love to be shut down in a nice, orderly way. So now we know how to start it. Now we have to break down. Now how do we connect to it? Well, if you're an old timer and you're using a Linux shell like Bash, you can type MySQL, which is the client program, and then the database name. And this will go out to a local box, usually copying on port 3306, and connect to MySQL. Well, what if you have passwords enabled? You know, your sysadmin is a real stickler for, for that sort of stuff. You actually want to use password and accounts. Well, these pass options, like my shoes, you can use a minus password, or you can use a minus key, and it'll copy for it. Something else you can do is that the script will set the command uh, level. Type MySQL and then the BB name, just like up here, and then left bracket or left arrow, the script name, which 
should have contained a bunch of SQL commands. And then you can type that to an output file. This will run all the commands in this SQL file into that database. And then any output from that will go to that table. Anyone here not sufficient enough to Linux to understand that? Okay. Okay. What if your MySQL database is not on your host? Well, then you have to pass in a host command. This can be a qualified domain name or an IP address. Uh, you sometimes will see it minus, minus host and minus h, both of the equivalent. Okay. You've done all that, and you've actually connected. And you can see this column we are. What is this actually telling me? Well, here's the MySQL Mesh root for the, for the user root to the world database. And it's welcome to the MySQL monitor command center with a semicolon or a slash short case G. Your actual connection number two to the box, the type of version you have, uh, some copyrights, and it comes up with a MySQL prompt. And then if you type in slash s, backslash s, they'll use some information about your box. In this case, we're still connection to, we're connected to the world database. Tell us what our current user is. Occasionally what happens is you'll log in and you don't have the permission to do stuff. And you can't figure out why because it worked last night. You know, why would I come back this morning and it's there? I mean, you probably changed users. Uh, the other thing to notice is character sets. Uh, here on the server, the server is talking Latin 1, the client is talking ETF 8. Uh, as long as you're not putting in Mandarin, Umlauts, Sedils, that sort of thing, you'll be fine. Once again, please do not mix character sets unless you want to move your data. Okay, so you're connected, you see the status, what can I actually do? Well, if you type the command show databases with a semicolon, or show databases with a backslash G, it will show you the available databases out there on this box. Or it will show you available databases on this box that you have permission to see. There's a subtle difference there. Um, these are the ones that this user want to use. Now, someone will ask, why have a semicolon in line with a backslash G? Just the way the standard is. Now I've got it there, I want to get out. Backslash Q for Twitter. Okay, how do you load data in MySQL? You've got this wonderful database, you're going to bring it up, you're going to bring it down, you're going to connect to it, now I'm going to get data into it. Well, we offer several example databases. Uh, the world database is used in most of our documentation and our certification. Uh, it's from the world CIA World Back Program about 12 years ago. Uh, we also have a movie database, and we have a Zipkila database, which has all the stuff in there. And free to download from MySQL.com. So how do you load it? Well, I'll show you start up MySQL with whatever flag you need. So I'll create the database, in this case, world. And then you have to say, okay, I need to get into that database. So you have to use world backslash G. And then you tell us the source, the file, that you download it. And in a few moments, you'll have facts and figures of every country in the world as of 12 years ago. So, so far we know how to install it, start it, stop it, connect to it, and load the data. So we connect again, and we're in the world database and say, okay, show tables. And in this case, it's showing three tables, city, country, and country language. And now you can actually write SQL. Uh, if SQL is odd to you, um, some of the no SQL stuff coming out will seem even hotter. So by the bullet, try to learn what lines of uh, SQL. We're saying select the name column and the country code column from a table called city, which we have here, where the population is greater than 10 million. And we see here, it executes and gives us the answer. Now those of you who are looking sharply will notice that instead of a small g or a semicolon over here, I have a backslash capital G. 
Up here with semicolon gas up P, I'm going to replace it in a vertical format. Capital G, you get a horizontal format. Okay, so now we're going to have to install, start, stop, and connect to your MySQL database to load some data. Most important thing DBAs do on a regular basis is backup. A SAM is not a backup. Replication is not a backup. Only backups are backups. Uh, if you're an admin but not to MySQL, uh, you're wasting tape and time if you don't know how to restore the entire database, just a table or just a line from a table. So how do we do a backup? Well, most MySQL backups are two things. And that'll be a snapshot or serializing the data out to a file. The most common that comes with the community version is MySQL dump. And you say, okay, give us markets, in this case, all databases, and type it to a file dump.sql. By the way, if you forget that, go get a cup of coffee, go get lunch. Um, while we're in the screen, it's going to take a while before everything comes back to your screen uh, to do the entire backup to your screen. Now you have to go to other options. In this case, you can say, okay, from the database, these various databases, DBA, DB1, 2, and 3, and put them in that file. Okay, so now we know how to do the backups. How do we get the backup back? Well, you fire up MySQL again, and you just type in that file. Very simple. Now, there are some backup tools out there. Uh, for Conan Agile, they, they have, we have an enterprise backup tool. Uh, there are other things out there. But for beginners, nine times out of ten, the first backup you're ever going to do is going to be my skill job. It's a quick hand tool. Okay, I talked a lot about this tomorrow for the full hour session on login and authentication. My skill authentication is a little primitive. Those of you who are used to dealing with Pam, we do have Pam plugin, it makes it a little more uh, robust. But out of the box, when you're first starting out, it is very primitive. Within MySQL, we have a confusing database called MySQL. <laughs> um, we probably should just call it stuff you don't mess with once you're in the EA, but we decided to call it MySQL. And in there you see a whole bunch of tables, and one of those is the user table. And it has all the information about your password, your login, your various privileges. Uh, so you get confused. Um, trying to do it, do it by hand are messy, unless you're a touch typist with 100% accuracy and you're 100% fresh. Please use some sort of GUI tool uh, like MySQL Workbench. PHP um, Maya and something like that, they're all great. PHP Maya used to have the nasty habit of giving every new user you created a drop privilege. Uh, that doesn't give you a sure that it's fine. Uh, change drop privilege to drop baby or drop laptop. Uh, other thing if you're a new DBA, be very, very stingy with permissions. Only give them out when you really, really have to because you'll never get them back. And the brilliant developer who will drop the council seatable table at Friday at 3.30 just as you're heading out to the long weekend, um, we'll do it again and again if you take that away from me. Also, if you're serious about being a DBA, read through chapter six of the MySQL manual on a regular basis. So, in the MySQL database, in the user table, we have a list of hosts that you're allowed to come into, the user, the password, the privileges, some connection constraints, like the number of things you can do, time will allow them to be connected, and some other stuff that very few people use. The first thing the server checks is your IP address. Uh, if, you give it a nice, if you give it a qualified name and your DNS is down, it will hang for a while until it airs out. So if the host is on the whitelist and you're allowed in, then it will check for the username and the password. Works great, except that you'll find out when your boss is doing a performance review from home that Joe at Fubinot has to have separate privileges that from Joe at Fubinot, from uh, Joe at Fubinot.com. Um, 
The other thing you'll find out is over years people don't maintain this table and you'll find eight or nine different entries for Joe, all the different permissions, might be two or three different Joes, and they move to a new office and suddenly they have job coach. Uh, and it's sort of that after they say, what does truncate database mean? <laughs> Cool, I highly recommend uh, MySQL Workbench. Go out and grab it. It's free. The reason I recommend it to novices is MySQL by itself has no idea of roles for administrators, DBAs, backup uh, operators, that sort of stuff. And with probably not fine here. And with this, you can create a user with these various roles, uh, DBAs or admin and all that. And it'll come through and give them all these privileges over here. Rather than just having all 26 privileges where update user set alter underscore privs equals to single quote uppercase y single quote comma grant underscore priv equal da 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 I don't know about you, I have back finger at 3 12 15 character. Uh, never get that done. Okay, so now we know how to install, start, stop, connect to, load, and back up a MySQL server. I'm warning right now that about twice a week I get calls from Fortune 100 and 500 companies saying, Where are the MySQL DBAs? I'll pay you $5,000. So, do you have any legal doubts about your job right now? Sure. Training. Oracle offers training for code office training. Sky School offers training. Your local community college may have offers training. Uh, there's only about 500 books out there. If you type beginning minus two L's on Google, you're probably going to get 15 trillion answers. Check with your local media group. I forgot to add it to the slide. The Boston MySQL Users Meetup. They run a program called MySQL Marinate. It's free, it's online, they work through a book. One chapter a week. You upload your answers to GitHub, or see your DBA from Mozilla will come through and check your answers. The only thing you need is a copy of the Learning MySQL book by Riley, which you usually find at half price bookstores or on somebody's desk, so it can cost you virtually nothing. Uh, first group they ran through earlier this year, I think they had 85 people show up. I think they have roughly the same this group, and they're halfway through it. I think they're in chapter 6 this week, and it's a 16 chapter book. Uh, if you have some spare time, you can catch up or anywhere in the next group. They call it Last You All Marinate. So if you know anyone who really wants to start at the zero and get up to speed with someone looking over their shoulder, I highly recommend that. Second thing, webinars. Seems like everyone in the last year community has webinars all the time. Uh, check on the web pages. Conferences. Uh, you see that I mentioned itself. We have the Zero DBA track this weekend. Uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, thanks to Jeremy and all the volunteers for letting us come in. Uh, this is one of the best exposures you can get. And anyone in the community, last year community, bug us, please, you love it. Uh, other conferences. Uh, MySQL Connect is happening this September in San Francisco. Uh, we have 268 people apply for 62 speaking slots. And these are some of the best engineers and MySQL folks in the world. Uh, last year we had Google, Pinterest, Facebook, uh, Playful Play, uh, a couple banks. Uh, this year we have some government officials, um, Google, Facebook, or that, uh, Twitter. Uh, probably the best conference if you want to go face to face with the engineers that we have. Uh, something else I recommend that you can do even right now uh, two websites, planet.mysql.com. We aggregate all the blogs that have anything even tangentially to do with MySQL. So you can read what our engineers are doing with the latest version 5.6. You can read what Peter Zyset's crew are doing with some of their variations. Uh, you can see what Facebook is doing. The other thing, if you ever get stuck, we have forums at MySQL.com. 
I think there's like 32 subgroups on there. And if you put in a question, usually within about four or five hours, you have at least an A minus answer from someone who knows the subject. So my skill the next show that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Monday, first Monday of uh, the local world, by the way, uh, we're having these tutorials. And these are taught by the best of the best. Um, I think the top of the being taught by one of our support engineers who is big in the PHP world and she really knows her stuff and she's good with the audience. Some of the others might be a bit of a stretch for some of the novices in here. <coughs> Get started with the MySQL cluster, should have a new MySQL cluster ready to go down with Books I suggest. Um, Sherry Cabral's MySQL Administrator Bible. If you're beginning to an intermediate DBA, you can have this on your desk. Um, this book, uh, MySQL, High Performance MySQL, third edition. Some books are saying the second or first edition at a very reasonable price. Third edition is going on. Uh, Peter Dreitz has been walking around with a copy, so you might be able to pry it out of his hand if you're not trying to. Uh, if you're experienced in DBA, you have one of these that looks like a collection of post it notes and scribbles. Also, there's a series from the Oracle Press by Ronald Bradford on uh, things like backup, query optimization, and replication. They're all about 110 pages in those plus. They're kind of like some of the really plain manual pages that you really well with some good examples. I recommend those. If you want to get certified, uh, for the meantime, the MySQL 5.0, yes, 5.0 is way, way, way old. Certification guide is still the best way to get yourself certified. Uh, the big difference is, I used to be the certification enterprise, MySQL ID. The big difference is when Oracle came in, Oracle doesn't do true false question on the certification exam, so I had to rewrite those. If you're thinking of getting certified and you have a copy of this around, it's still good for right now. Okay. How many of you just told me about wash out the seat? How many know how to lay legs? You'll have to from Texas and that happens here so often. Okay. This is supposed to be talking on the basics if you're a, a, a fairly seasoned person come back in um, three hours. So Oh, here, 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 here. Yeah. Slide share. Yeah, slide share. Yeah, I like 
do is you're waiting to talk to you. Well, first of all, what that sells them is the spreadsheet. Yeah. Right, right. And everybody uses, nobody knows the database when they first start and they use the tool they grab to sell, which is wrong, but yeah. they, they put a bunch of data in there. And then they have a whole bunch of And then they have a whole bunch of I try to get them off the Windows products as soon as possible. My main reason why is because the database is share their information coming in to block to their PC or their thumb drive or their, their uh, VM existence out there. Uh, the other thing is once it's out in the database and other people can access it, it becomes a hinge point for the company where they can actually make decisions about data. I've worked for dozens of companies in the past where, uh oh, Julie's out with a broken arm. Where's the data? We're stuck. We, we can't write a time check. We can't do anything for six weeks. Goodbye. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming out. I try to keep this lighthearted. And if you have any other questions, catch me in the hallway. Catch any of the other last two open duty books out there. Thank you, Bob. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, 
in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, 
allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.